working. Um, I'm going to juggle a little bit because I'm going to read something to you as we get this started, um, but then I just lost it. Oh, for crying. No, I didn't. Sorry. Um, anyway, first, a little bit about my background. I've been in the game industry for 26 and a half years now. Um, I've worked on a lot of stuff you've probably heard of, like Halo and Age of Empires and Forza and Fable and every Bioware game of the last 18 years and a lot of other stuff too. Um, so I've been around, um, I just got started on Age of Empires 4 uh, as of last week, which is really exciting for me because I worked on all the Age stuff, but that was 25 years ago is when we were working on those games, or almost 25 years ago. Anyway, um, what I'm going to talk about today is what we call lurk worker leverage. You might know it as the topic of unionization or guilds or how do we protect ourselves as people working in an industry that tends to work people pretty hard. Um, but I want to start out with um, this email that was sent to me late last year. And it was sent to me from a woman who's in a game design program uh, in Europe. And so I'd given a talk at their school, um, and it wasn't about this. It was just, I think it was uh, one of my culturalization talks doing a, that's actually what I've been doing for 26 years. I'm a geographer who does culturalization work. So I help game developers avoid making political and cultural mistakes that get them into big trouble. Um, but as it says there, I also, I did run the International Game Developers Association for five years. And as of three weeks ago, I am now the executive director of the Global Game Jam organization. So I hope to see you all over in the Pax Ice Center in January because we just went over and took a look at this space, which is awesome. So anyway, this letter. So, uh, dear Ms. Edwards, last year I attended one of your lectures at our school and you inspired me. As a young woman going into the game industry, it's amazing to see a woman like yourself advocating for our rights. Now, as you may have heard, in September and October, multiple controversies in our industry came up, and this is what I'm emailing you about. Within our school, we have a Slack channel that we use to discuss things that are going on in the industry right now. Recently, the incidents at Telltale Games and Rockstar Games came up. We've gone into a lot of discussion about this and about what we need to do uh, within our school teams to minimize this behavior. In the Slack channel, I see a lot of we need to unionize the game industry messages, and I see a lot of we need to get out of this mindset but it doesn't give me anything I feel any of us could possibly work with, they're just words. But to be honest with you, these incidents worry me. I'm concerned that when I come out of the university, I'll be forced to work as many hours crunching as you see in these incidents, and after all, these stories are not at all uncommon in our industry. I fear that while I love video games, and I'm passionate about creating them, I will no longer be able to see my loved ones and I'll be forced to work at a company that enforces ridiculous working habits as part of their, quote, culture. As mentioned, um, we've discussed a lot with our school about what we could do, but I'd like to ask you, what can we, the students of today and the developers of tomorrow, do against these practices? What steps can we take? What are ways that we can um, prevent this from happening? After all, we are the next generation of this industry. Um, is there anything that we can possibly do to end this? Right now, I am mainly afraid a oh, future awaits me. So this is not an uncommon sentiment. And I can imagine people in this room, there's people in this room who have that very same sentiment right now because we all hear the stories, we see the news, we're not closed off that much, we're not that introverted. Um, but the question is, what can, what can she do? But more importantly, it's about what can you do as well. And, and most importantly, it's about what can we do? What can we do as people who are in this industry to actually take steps to try and stop this behavior from recurring over and over? Because right now, one of the things that, one of the biggest problems that I've seen is just sort of this laziness about it. Like, well, that's just the way it is. And I'm just gonna have to expect that to happen. Now, the reason we're all in this room is because we love this. I put this because this is my very first video game, because that's how old I am. Um, but we all love this medium tremendously. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we have defied parent wishes to become doctors and lawyers and other 
things that are less respectable than a game developer, but that's, you know, we do this because we want to do it. We have a great admiration for this skill set and for this for the industry. We have respect for one another because our, the skill set that we represent and the talent that we all represent and just that common passion. So that's a given, I think, for a lot of us. That's why we're here. And so um, it's really not about that necessarily, even though we know that that last word, passion, is often something that gets leveraged by companies to gauge whether or not you're really willing to work 12 hour days or 15 hour days or 16 hour days. Because if you don't have passion, then all of a sudden it's like you don't apparently seem to want to make a video game, which they somehow equate that wanting to make a video game and being passionate about it also equates to wanting to work yourself to death and leave the industry five to seven years after you started, which tends to be the average for a lot of game developers these days. Um, so I was the former executive director of the IGDA. Um, I, in that capacity, I traveled a lot. I spoke with m literally thousands of develop developers all around the world as, as in every kind of situation you can imagine from you know, literal garage developers to people working in giant AAA studios, um, people working in emerging markets, um, everywhere in between. Even last year I was in Iran and the, the game development community in Iran is just amazing. It's really robust. Despite all of the, the political and economic problems that they're under, there's just an, this incredible shared passion for game creation there. Um, that was a, a group in Morocco. Um, so, and this was even, this was the Minister of Communication for Tunisia, um, one of the, the main people who run the country, and he actually co-owned a game studio when he lived in the UK before Tunisia had the revolution in 2011, and he loves video games. And people think, well, how would a government minister in Tunisia, they can't possibly be into games. Like, he is, he loves them. He's even giving his thumbs up. Um, so uh, when I ran the IG, I tried to make a difference as best as I could. I, I eventually felt that that may not be the mechanism to do it. That's why I left in 2017. But we tried a lot. We, we uh, addressed a lot of issues like diversity. Um, you know, of course, during the time it was also Gamergate was going on, so I got my share of harassment and death threats and everything else because all it, all it meant is that if you're a woman in a leadership position in the game industry at that time, it means you are an instant target just by your gender. Um, so yeah, we did a lot of things, tried to make a difference. Um, we did a, the survey, the develop, developer satisfaction survey to get data about the industry um, and, and just supported a lot of different really cool things. So, um, and even after I left, I joined the board of TakeThis.org, which deals with mental health in the game industry, because one of the most common problems I saw in all of these side effects of crunch and other negative work practices was the effect on mental health. Obviously, it has a dimension on physical wellness as well, but the mental health component was, was extremely serious, and it was so common among so many people. That's one of the reasons I joined that, that board. Um, um, but like I said, it was a difficult time to be in that position. Um, yeah, it wasn't a friendly time at all. Um, so yeah, I have my scars to prove it here and there. But anyway, um, let's not focus on that. What I really want to focus on is what do game creators want? In all of that experience I've had talking with the game developers all around the world and traveling all over the place, as I still do quite a bit, um, one of the things that's common that I hear from game developers pretty much in any walk of life is this word leverage. Now they may, they may not always say the word leverage, but what they describe to me is they want to feel like they have control, like they have some ability to push back against the practices that they see, like crunch and some other things. So that's what leverage is, is this, a, is this desire to basically have your, your collective crowbar to kind of push back against the practice. Now, unfortunately, you may not be able to see this in the back, um, but I'll just describe it a little bit. So this is one of the questions that we put in our developer satisfaction survey in the IGDA. And so reasons wanting to leave the game industry. So right there, this large bar here is I want a better quality of life. So it's obviously a huge spike in answers. People would, that's the reason they would leave the industry is because they want a better quality of life. The other ones here, like found a job with better pay in hours, I was burned out, don't want another job in the industry, which is kind of another form of burnout. We also asked them which of these reasons captures why you choose to be self-employed or co a contractor freelance. And right there, number one answer, more control over working conditions. That doesn't really surprise me. Um, the other two, which is also not too surprising because we all are artists in our own way and we have, we have, we are creators. 
um, more control over content and making the games I want to make. That's very natural for artists. Eventually you would love to do the stuff that you've had percolating in your head for years and you'd like to work on your own things. But again, more control over working conditions. Do you feel there's equal treatment and opportunity for all in the game industry? You see a lot of people said no. Um, no or not sure. Um, so what's driving these sentiments? I mean, this is something that we keep seeing year over year recurring. And um, part of it is the work-life ba work balance issue, the crunch issue is usually how it's expressed. Um, there's also this sense of unfairness. When we hear stories like we did last year in 2018, like every single month we had some major upheaval in the industry, whether it was Telltale's closure, a riot sexism scandal, or something else going on. Um, this kind of general sense of unfairness, like why are people being treated this way? Or even locally with the arena net incident with the community managers being booted from the company. Um, toxic work environments is something we hear about a lot. And I think a lot of you who are probably on the cusp of, of trying to find your first job, you might already be out there talking to different communities online to find out, hey, does anyone work at this company? I'm kind of curious what their culture is like. And then just also this, this sense of growing dissent, um, but a collective dissent. It's not just one voice saying that they're tired of this. It's a lot of people standing up together and saying that, which has not happened before because all of these issues have been existent since the game industry started decades ago, but we have not seen the kind of collective voice around the response to it until just the last couple of years. So one of the things I want to encourage you as I go through this talk is to think about this notion of being a warrior poet. You've probably heard that term before, which is basically, you know, it's a combination of strength and the will to change things, but doing it in a way that's intelligent and, uh, and empathetic to the people around you. So I encourage you to be a creator advocate. So no, don't just create games, but as you create games, think about what kind of advocacy, meaning changing the industry that you might be able to do through your own actions. And we'll go through this um, as I talk more. Just kind of have that in your head about being a creator advocate. Um, so what can creator advocates do to build a better industry? Well, let's see, one of the first things I really encourage you to do, um, and this is a really simple thing which you can do in this very moment, is embrace your craft for what it really is. And this is what I mean by that. So these are forms of, of communication that exist throughout human history. These are just a sampling of some of the major forms of media and communication. Every one of these has been used in one way or another to communicate story and experience from one generation to another. That's what we rely on these for. We started out with visual art and then language and then writing and all these other forms throughout history to share with each other experience and to share with each other the lore of our culture or just the imaginary lore that we created. And right now, video games, we are the current evolution of that human narrative. And that's not a small thing. I think that's something really you know, strong to be proud of. Um, because I still get some people who work in this industry, or students especially, who say, I'm just a, a student, or I'm just a game developer. And I want to slap them upside the head. It's like, you're not just anything. This is you. You are the ones evolving all of this. You're deciding currently how human beings trans uh, transport um, story and experience from one generation to another and you're doing it through a combination of art and technology and I think that's pretty amazing. The other thing is embrace your economic power. Now I think this is an argument most of us already know but I want to reinforce it anyway. So this is 2017 data so excuse it for being a little old but it still is fairly much on par right now um, with where the industry was last year and this year. So you can see here um, these are different forms of entertainment. If you can't see it well, there's books and cinema, live music, physical home video. Um, this is a, a, a streaming video and then recorded music. So I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard when people say that games make more money than film and music combined. That's true. If you look at the chart, you know, here we go, film and music. We do make more money than those two together. What I find even more amazing though is that if you take every form of live sport in the world, NFL, baseball, FIFA, everything, you combine all of those live sports together, we still make more money than they do. It's amazing. 
We are an incredible economic powerhouse. And so, and yet I still encounter a lot of people in this industry who kind of have this idea like we're just kind of starting out here. We're just getting going. It's like, we are, that's the scary part. We are just getting going as a technology and as an art form and we're already kicking ass over everything else. That's not gonna change. As we know with the growth of esports and everything else, this is gonna continue to evolve. The other thing too is I encourage you to embrace your collective voice. So um, I'm sure you have seen stories like this pop up over the last year and a half or so where there's a lot of media now, especially the games related media, talking about unionization. Um, and so, uh, and the general consensus along a lot of the media articles is that this is the time, this is when it finally needs to happen. And so I wanna talk about that a little bit. Um, so. The opinions about unionization over, over time have changed quite a bit over the last decade. So you can see here the IGA, um, they used to have something called the quality of life survey before I changed it into the developer dissatisfaction survey. So t uh, 10 years ago, 32% of respondents said they would join a union if it formed today. So okay, about, you know, about one out of three. Um, 2014, um, so that had risen to 56% of the respondents said that they would join a union if it was created today. Uh, in 2017, this uh, study that was done, these are actually the same people who help us with, this, with uh, the IGA survey that we created. They did their own independent survey and they found that 66% were in favor of a local union, whereas a whopping 82% were in favor of an industry-wide union. And then the GDC survey that they did earlier this year, right before GDC, 73% said either yes or maybe to the idea of, of joining a union. So this is quite a shift. Now the, the idea is that we were supposed to be getting better in the industry. Things were supposed to get better. We were supposed to see less crunch and less of these problems. And technically we have, because if you look at crunch data, it actually has gotten a little bit better. Not a lot, but it's gotten a little bit better. Um, and yet we still have this sentiment. Um, and it's, so it's not being driven only by the crunch issue. It's being driven by other perceptions as well. So just to look a little more closely from the GDC survey, because it's the most recent. So it says, do you think that workers in the video game industry should unionize? About half the people thought yes. They said 47%. Um, but the more interesting one is when they said, do you think that uh, workers will unionize? And that goes way down to 21%. So there's a lot of skepticism on whether, whether or not that's really going to happen. Um, and so uh, it already has happened, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but it hasn't happened in the United States, which is an uh, interesting dimension of all this. So uh, what, I want, what I do want to talk about, though, is what exactly are we talking about when we talk about unions? So there's this notion of collective bargaining. So basically what a union is, it's one of the forms of collective bargaining, which is basically what a group of less powerful individuals they c with similar goals come together and they basically uh, find a way to negotiate with the more powerful uh, opposite entity, usually a company, and basically make an agreement, this is how much we want to get paid for this kind of work or for these kind of, these are the kind of benefits we want for this amount of time we spend here, things like that. That's a bit, essentially what a union facilitates is collective bargaining. There's a lot of places in the world, like I worked in the Netherlands last year at a school called uh, Breda University, which is a, has an amazing game design program like here. Um, and as a, an employee of the school for, for half the year, um, they had a collectively bargained agreement. So when I show up as an American, I'm like, okay, let's negotiate my salary. And they're like, no, it's already been negotiated. We collectively bargain all of that across the entire education system in the, in the Netherlands. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's, this is what you're making. You don't negotiate it. This is, that's it. Um, but it was great because you didn't have to think about it. It was a fair salary plus all the benefits that were, uh, you were entitled to were also baked into that salary. Um, so some, they selected forms of leverage that I want to talk more specifically about, um, the, which are also forms of uh, some form of collective bargaining. Um, so guilds and unions and legal defense funds and also public engagement. So let's dig into each of these. So you've probably heard the term guild before, and I know sometimes there's a lot of confusion between what's a guild versus what's a union. Well, the, the differentiation, at least technically, is pretty simple. So a, a guild is a collective bargaining organization for independent contractors. That's essentially what it is. So if you've got a whole massive group of freelancers, the guild is there to basically represent their interests, give them the legal resources they need, help them with bargaining for certain rates, 
Um, this happens all across Hollywood, as I'm sure you've probably heard. Um, what, but the concept of a guild actually goes back for many, many centuries. So it goes all the way back to the Roman era, where different, uh, different cities in ancient Rome had guilds. And in the medieval times, that's actually one of the things um, you would see as you would enter a city, like this is an example from Europe. As you would enter the city, you would see this plaque and you would see like all these different guild plaques and it would basically tell you these are the official guilds that exist in this city. Um, so you could see like there's barrel makers and uh, you know wheel makers and all these other kind of functions that happen to be in the city. Actually, if you've seen today, like when you drive into a city and some cities still have that little thing like welcome to whatever and they'll have like the plaques of like the Kiwanis Club and the Eagles Club and all that you know Shriners and things like that that whole concept of putting the plaques out when you enter the city came from this that's actually where it's from so um, and so of course in Hollywood like I said they have guilds um, some of these have actually evolved more into a union like entity but for the most part like if you think about actors actors are essentially like independent contractors most of them sometimes they do get hired directly by a studio but for a lot of them they are independent and they basically the Screen Actors Guild for example represents their interests and has, has collectively bargained with the studios across Hollywood this is how much they make for this kind of work and this kind of time and so on and so on um, now, conversely, a union, um, it's also a collective bargaining entity, but it's for employees. So that's why oftentimes when unions get started, they get started within the context of a specific company. Um, and that's why you may have heard, like, when unions get created, you'll, you'll have people, like union representatives, show up at a company and they're trying to get people within a specific company to organize and come together and form a union within that company. And that's when you have the management of that specific company sort of resisting and pushing back and uh, basically saying, no, we don't want this because obviously they don't because they're management. Um, so that's basically what a union is. Um, so it's not just necessarily a huge catch-all for any kind of collective bargaining. Um, so it's also another definition is essentially a continuous association of wage earners for the purpose of maintaining and improving the conditions of their employment. So it's basically everyone coming together within a certain company saying, we've had enough, we're all getting screwed, there's a gender wage gap, there's other problems here, um, we want to normalize all of this and we basically want things to be cool and so that we know how much we get paid for the kind of work that we're doing. Um, and it doesn't have to be all secret and everything. Um, unions have been around a very long time as well, but they are a more modern entity. It's, they've been around for about 150 years or so. They started in the UK, um, but they are now, of course, a whole global thing all over the place. Even in nice, calm places like Finland, they've got unions. So um, what's really interesting, though, this chart um, that I found that the, this is the share of income going to the top 10% of earners versus um, the, the American workers belonging to unions. So this is 1917 and two, uh, 2014. So you can see that union membership, was um, union membership was actually quite low, and then it rose as we got into the 20th century, and now it's kind of tapered off. It's only 11% of workers in the US actually belong to a union. But you can see the concentration of wealth at the top percent of the society, you know, so basically as the union's union uh, membership increased, it kind of had a normalizing effect of, of spreading the wealth a bit more because people were guaranteed to get certain pay for the work. But when you go away from that model, that's where you start seeing the wealth accumulate back up into management. So I'm sure all of us have heard about the 1% and how much money they make and how much money, like the, what is it, something like the 1% of the United States holds like 40% of the nation's wealth or something like that. It's crazy. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, because that there is no mechanism for ensuring that that wealth actually spreads out to the employees. You know, it's just like the story that I, I showed earlier where Blizzard, you know, on the same day they, they recorded record profits, they laid off a whole ton of people, you know, on the exact same day. It's just like you could not get more douchebaggy than that. Um, and it's also interesting, too, that the, the, the gender wage gap um, with salary workers um, between union and non-union, you can see that there's basically, yes, there is still a gap, um, which is, is also a systemic problem within different companies, but the gap is less than it is with non-union, mainly because, again, the union ensures that for a certain kind of job, you must pay the person that amount of money, and you can't get around that because it's been collectively bargained between the, en between the union and the company. So there are a couple unions, there's actually a few unions already 
in the game industry. In Finland, there's this th group called Game Makers. They're kind of a quiet little union that's been around for quite a while. Um, STJ Bay started in France two years ago, and um, they got they got some attention, but not a lot of t attention because you know if it's Tuesday in France, you form a union. It's just something. <laughs> it's just something that happens. So it's not a shock to people when a union gets created in France. Um, but it's great that there is one. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Game Workers Unite. So this group showed up at GDC last year, 2018, and really started you know, pushing the dialogue, which I thought was awesome. And I've been associated with them and kind of talking with them on the side. Um, and I love what they're doing. They're, they're basically trying to educate people on what is a union, what, what, what benefit will it give you. Um, and out of this effort, actually, earlier this year, the uh, Game Workers Unite UK was formed. So this is actually a union that now exists in the UK. They partnered with the Independent Workers Guild um, in Great Britain, and so this is now a union. It's the first union um, in the UK for game developers. And so, is this going to happen in the US? I don't know. I would love to see it happen. There's a lot of people who are looking to companies like Riot, with all of the crap that's been going on at Riot in the, over the last year, they're like, this is one of those companies where they seem really ripe for organizing in some, in some way. Um, but we don't know, because creating a union in the, in the United States is a lot different from creating it in you know, Great Britain or France or somewhere else. Um, there, it's a lot of politics involved. It's a lot more complicated socially um, than it is in some other countries. Now another form of leverage is what would be called a legal defense fund. So one of the key things that a legal defense fund does is it provides access to legal counsel. So like if you're an indie developer, you have the ability to go talk to an, a lawyer without paying a ridiculous amount of money out of pocket and just get some advice. Um, the fund also tries to help cover legal expenses for people who can't afford it and also educate people on labor laws and worker rights. So this is actually something that I'm working on right now. I'm trying to get this off the ground, what I call the Game Creators Legal Defense Fund, um, because I actually feel this is gonna help a lot of people in this industry by giving them the legal leverage that I think they need. Because in a lot of cases, for example, when I've been talking to some of my lawyer colleagues about this idea, some of them have said, you know what, this is easy. All they have to do is go after some of the game companies in California, because California labor laws are pretty strong, and most of those companies break those laws every day. So all we have to do is go after a couple of those companies and win a court case, and you could show that you know now you guys have to actually follow the law. Um, which could potentially improve working conditions like right away um, by being compliant because right now there's not enough enforcement or accountability for those companies to actually follow the law as it's written. And something like this would actually help make that happen. It would basically be a, a force of leverage um, to do that. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to put together right now. It's been slow going. It's not easy to start a nonprofit, let me tell you. Um, the other thing I think is really important in terms of leverage is the concept of public engagement. And a lot of people may not think about this as being a form of leverage for us as game creators, but I really feel strongly that it is. And what I mean by this is basically seeing the public as being more than consumers. They're not just the people who are throwing money at your game and uh, allowing you to pay your bills. Um, these are people who are just like you, back to that earlier slide with Pong, they love this medium. They're passionate about it like you are. They are passionate players about it. And they love your game. That's why they gave you money so they could buy your game. Um, we need to do a better job in, as a list in listing them as an ally in the dialogues around games as being culture. Not just being games as an economic force, and not just being games as like this cool new thing in esports, blah, blah, blah. It's like actually helping us make the argument that games are relevant culture to them. Just in the same way that every other medium that's, that I showed before, you know, all of those other forms of medium, uh, media had to go through a certain transition period in human society to finally be accepted. I mean, even things like the written book. When the, when the printed book, way back in Gutenberg's time, was first created, people were arguing that this is dangerous because now the public, the, the, you know, the people down below the castle, now they're going to be able to get knowledge and that could be dangerous for us. And guess what? It was. <laughs> it's like that's why you don't really have any monarch monarchies anymore. But um, even things like the waltz, when the waltz, the dance, the waltz was first introduced, people were saying it was scandalous that a man and a woman would be so close together when they're dancing. It's just like frightening, um, you know. While they're also layered in like you know 50 pounds of clothing, but. Um, 
So public engagement is really important. I think one of the things that we absolutely need to do a better job of, and I encourage you to do this throughout your career, and you can even start doing it now, is opening the black box of game creation to the public. And um, so for in every game development ecosystem that exists anywhere in the world, you typically have three parts to it. You've got the great game creators, which is you. You've got the government, and you've got the education system, which is also you. Um, so these three, when they're in balance and they work together, it actually creates a really good ecosystem because they all support each other. Now, around all of this, of course, is the game playing public. These are the people who love the, our medium already. We don't have to convince them to play games. We're not trying to. They already love what we, what we do. The problem, though, as we've seen in terms of shaping the public narrative around our art form, are these people the non-playing public, the people who knee-jerk react to something they see in a game, they see in one image from Grand Theft Auto or whatever it might be, and they just have a whole you know, crap fit about it, and they contact the government, and they're angry about it, and say, this game is offending me, this game is a problem, um, you know, my kid learned how to F-bomb from this game, it's like, I kind of doubt that, but, um, you know, the problem is that that group of people tend to be very vocal. And, and unfortunately, right now, we still live in an era where the government, a lot of the government people, because they tend to be older, um, they still see games as, as toys. So like, for example, if a video game offends somebody from this group, and they go complaining to the government saying, this needs to be regulated, then um, you know, it's the, basically they treat us like a toy that's defective. Like if a Frisbee, if you take a Frisbee and throw it, and every single time you throw it, it always comes back and hits you in the head, which I think would be amazing. But <laughs> that would, they would consider that defective, and so therefore the Frisbee must be banned and regulated and controlled. And right now, a lot of politicians still see video games in that way. That's changing too, because obviously with the demographic shift, as more and more younger people become uh, go into politics, these are people who grew up with video games, and I, I am convinced in, within 20 years, um, it's gonna change radically, because everyone in government all around the world will have grown up with video games, and I don't think it's gonna be as much of an issue. My reason for being so loud about it right now is because I don't think we should wait 20 years. Plus, I'm gonna be in my 70s then, and I don't wanna be on my deathbed, no, I'm, I don't know, we'll see. Or in cryogenic <laughs> sleep or somewhere. But um, anyway, I don't wanna wait. I don't think we have to wait. We deserve to have our place now because we are already this amazing kick-ass medium. Like I said, major economic force, we're reshaping public narrative. We should not have to wait for this to happen. But I think part of that relies on us to take action. So what we could do instead is what if we engage our game playing public more and as well as the non-playing public, I'm not saying just throw them to the wayside, um, but what if we did more effort to engage them in terms of what we actually do? Now, if you take the film industry as an example, um, most people know how films get made. It's not a mystery. There's tons of movies about making movies. And so there's no big mystery about how the games, or excuse me, how the films are being created and all that. But with games, for most people in the public, based on all the conversations I've had, it's a huge black box. They have no idea what we do. And sometimes you know, they'll actually say, well, I think you sit around all day wondering how violent to make this game. And I'm like, well, sometimes we do. I worked on all the Dead Rising games, and we actually did think about that. So, um, because that's the whole point of the game, is how creatively can you kill zombies. Um, but I think if we do more effort to engage, I think we can really make the difference. Um, for example, there is a story I was told um, from an indie group that, well, they were a small studio, I think about 20 people up in Canada, and they said a local MP, a uh, member of parliament in their, in their province, was very anti-video game, just like staunchly, I, you know, this is a bad force, blah, blah, blah. So they decided to open their doors literally to this guy one day, and they had him there for a few hours. They sat him down, he let him play with a ZBrush, and they let him try Unity, and they, he met all the team. He found out these are actually really nice people. They have families, they pay their taxes, which I like, and, um, and he found out that this is actually a viable tech business. And so amazingly, in one day, one day of, of engagement like that flipped this guy 180 degrees. So now he's like, I need to support this. This is actually a really cool industry, and these people are really skilled at what they do, and they pay their taxes, so I need to help them. Um, the other thing that, I, that I'm pondering right now, whether or not this is actually going to be 
useful, but pushing the idea of ethical sourcing or ethical production in video games. Because I know that some people, at least on the industry side, I know I just had this conversation a few days ago with people at PAX where they said I, they did not buy Red Dead Redemption 2 because the stories about Rockstar employees spending 100 hours a week playing the game. And they're like, I'm not going to buy that game. I'm not going to support that. I don't care how successful it is. I'm, I'm not going to spend my money because of that. And so that's the concept of ethical sourcing. Now, a lot of times we hear ethical sourcing in the context of things like Starbucks coffee beans and Nike sneakers and things like that, where it's like, we're not going to have children making the sneakers in Thailand, and we're going to make sure the coffee farmers are treated fairly and paid well for what we give them. Um, you know, would this concept also apply to video game production? Maybe. I don't know. We know from research that the public, they actually really believe in ethical sourcing. Um, if, when you've seen surveys, when they ask people, like, would you buy this or that under certain conditions, um, they really believe in it strongly. But when it comes to the actual act of purchase, that's where all of that kind of goes out the window, because then it's a matter of like, well, but that one's cheaper. I don't care if it was made by 10-year-olds in China, that's cheaper. Um, so that's the problem. You still have a breakdown of their own personal ethics when it comes to the actual point of purchase. But it's just an idea to ponder. You know, it's one of the ideas that I'm trying to push a little bit when I give talks, especially outside the game industry, is the idea of, you know, treating us fairly as game creators and making sure that you're buying a game that was created under conditions that are, you know, have a... Uh, a good work-life balance, their inclusive environment, not toxic, things of that nature. Um, so will these things prevent, will these forms of leverage that I've mentioned prevent like incompetent managers? No, because those have been around since for all of human history. Is it gonna prevent crunch entirely? No, it isn't, because there will be people out there who still wanna push that as a method for development. Is it gonna stop layoffs? No, because there's layoffs happen for all kinds of reasons. Um, I think the telltale one was really grievous and uncalled for, but then there's other times where it happens because there's other business factors at play, like a merger, for example. You merge two teams together, and you might have too many people doing the same kind of job, um, and all of these things. So it's, is it going to stop these things? No, but I believe very strongly that all of these forms of leverage can actually buffer us from the effects of it. So if you take the telltale example last year, where one, the week before, the studio, widely respected, apparently we thought was doing financially well, critically acclaimed, all of that kind of stuff, and then one week later it doesn't exist. That quickly, that is scary. And the problem is that none of those people got severance pay, they didn't get benefits, they got nothing as a result of being kicked out the door. And something like a union or a guild or some other form of leverage would actually prevent that from happening, and that's what should have happened. Now, ideally, you would say, well, the company should have done the right thing. Well, obviously, they didn't know what they were doing. If they existed one week and they're gone the next, so that's a whole other conversation. Um, but to end on this note, uh, hopefully a note of encouragement, because I want to encourage you to be the person who's willing to, st to step up and think about what you can do as a creator advocate. So now I'm gonna merge into a little public service announcement. Um, so I know that some people, especially when they give a talk like this, ask themselves, well, who am I? I'm just a student. Remember, don't say just. You're the future talent of the industry. Um, what can I do? I don't have what it takes. Isn't it enough just to make my game? Um, and my answer is, it's not. I think all of us ha can have a responsibility to do whatever it takes, even a tiny little thing in our corner of the world, to make a difference. So I will give my own example here. I also ask those questions to myself because I am a, for example, I am an introvert, uh, big time introvert, and I'm totally faking extroversion right now, as you can see. Um, these are a lot of labels I can add to myself. Every one of you in here can do the same. We all serve different roles in our life. Even throughout a single day, there's different things that we have to do. Am I a geek? Absolutely. Um, there I am giving a lecture on Halloween in Norway. Um, and it's so geeky because not only am I wearing my Indiana Jones cosplay, but I'm actually describing my work on Star Wars The Old Republic. So I'm talking about force lightning. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but, um, and it gets worse. Like when I go to places like Tunisia, I have to go to places like the original Lars Homestead or uh, in Dubrovnik at the Reboot Conference, you recreate th scenes from Game of Thrones. Or last year, right before Gamescom, I was in Ireland for a week and I went to Skellig Michael. And of course, you 
you know, recreate scenes from Star Wars. <laughs> so, um, because that's what you do. So anyway, um, my issue was that I had a big problem as a consultant. I left Microsoft in 2005 after 13 years, and I became a consultant. And I left because I had that confidence that I knew, I thought I knew what I was talking about, um, doing this culturalization work and, and for so long. But I'd reached a point where I had, every single time I would email my clients, I would be hyper nervous, like this is the moment where everyone's gonna know I screwed up, I don't know what I'm talking about, everyone's gonna see that I'm a total fraud. Um, and so what saved me though is The Matrix. Now, I'm assuming, even though this film is 20 years old, I hope some of you have seen this movie. Woo! Yes, and if you have, and remember, movie singular, there are no three movies, there's only one. Um, so, this movie actually changed things for me. So I'm a, part of my geekness is that I love movie scores. It's pretty much the main thing I listen to. Uh, Seattle Symphony did a, a uh, one of their uh, concerts was the Matrix in concert where the original composer, Don Davis, he was there to conduct his own f music to the entire film which was shown above the stage, which I love that kind of stuff. So I went and saw this concert while I was really struggling with this issue of why I'm unable to like just feel relaxed in my own expertise. And so we get to this part in the movie, which um, if you've seen it, if you haven't, go see it today. It's 20th anniversary, um, where Morpheus, the mentor to the, the protagonist Neo, says to him, don't think you are, know you are. And in that moment in the concert hall, I just started bawling my eyes out. I was crying like crazy, and my friend who was with me was kind of confused because she had never seen this movie before and was wondering what's so emotional about this. But um, for me, the, the, what, I, what I had had in this moment, even though I had seen this movie a hundred times, was this epiphany that my, my disbelief in my own skills does not make them disappear. And it doesn't make them invisible to people around you. So you can doubt them all you want, but that doesn't mean you don't have them. So that's really the struggle. It's not the struggle whether or not you have the skill, even though we all want to strive to get better at what we do, but it's whether or not we accept that skill ourselves. So it was always having that struggle with knowing the reality of what others perceive in you, even if you struggle to think if you have those skills or not. And so that was really the moment where I basically broke out of this. Um, and there was a lot of other stuff going on in my life at the time that kind of added to the emotion of it. Um, this is what we call imposter syndrome. And um, yeah, you can see, okay, whatever. Um, so yeah, so imposter syndrome is typically when you're walking around and you, this is what it happens, is what you know and what others, what you think others know. You think everyone else knows far more than you do. And that it's just like, you know, you're just this tiny little person in this room of other experts. Um, but the reality though is that what you know is pretty much the same as everyone else around you. If you're an artist, for example, and you're sitting in a room of artists, every single one of you is unique because you bring to that art your own life experience and your own perspective and your own style that will always be yours. Then when we look across the, you know, look across the room and say, I will never be like that person, um, it's like, but they, they're bringing something different. Maybe they're thinking the same thing about you. You just don't know that. Um, if you think that looks like a Death Star, that is intentional, so um, it's like, don't think about the Death Star, think about the pretty flower, don't think about imposters that sit within, so, um, like if I show a picture like this, and I ask people which one of these is better, now a lot of times people will pick one or the other, um, which is fair, but that's a preference, that's not, that's not objective saying, well that one I know for a fact is better. This is Rembrandt and that's Picasso, two of the greatest artists in human history, and yet their styles are radically different. In the same token, you think about these two things, and it's like, which one is better? And yeah, some people would knee jerk and say, well, this one obviously is better, but, but is it? You know, it depends on your preference, and both of these take skill to create. I know some remarkable pixel artists that get shat on by other people because they can't make stuff like this. Well, it's not that they can't, it's just they choose not to, because this is a style just like that's a style, and they're both valid. Um, one of the things I think is really important to remember is this fantastic quote by Mark Twain, who said, comparison is the death of joy. And when it comes to imposter syndrome, this is the one thing that will kill your progress when you start comparing yourselves to other people around you. So my encouragement is if you do see someone across the room who does something you think is a lot better than you, guess what? You just found a mentor. 
go ask them. Just don't be shy. Just go ask them and say, hey, I love what you, how, what, what you did here. I love how you did it. Can you teach me how to do that? And most people would be nice and say, yeah, I can teach you that. Let's figure out when we can do it. Um, that's one of the things I love about this industry is that game developers tend to be so cooperative and open with one another because we all are basing that on that foundation of love for the art form. So I would encourage you, whatever it is that you feel might be holding you back, whether you have to go through your own matrix experience or something, you have to embrace it. And embrace the adver adversity. It could also be your crucible. Um, it's your forge that turns you into something different. It basically opens you up to that next level of potential. Um, if you follow the writings of Joseph Campbell, who wrote The Power of Myth um, and The Hero's Journey, upon which Star Wars and a lot of other um, narratives have been uh, based for you know many years, he called it the supreme ordeal, where basically you start out, quote, normal, and you go through your supreme ordeal and come out the other side you know, wielding a lightsaber or wearing spandex or something. <laughs> I like to think of it as your superpowers, because I fully believe that every single person on this planet has some form of a superpower. Um, it's just a matter of discovering it. What can you do that other people don't do as well? Um, and so for me, when I went through that transition for myself, that period of difficulty and kind of embraced that adversity, I came out the other side, and friends of mine were using this word. They kept saying that I seemed fierce. There, I had changed, my attitude had changed, and, and rather than kind of sitting back and just letting things happen, they noticed that I was now being much more proactive about a lot of things about my environment that I did not like. And so it's kind of, that was my spark of advocacy. And yes, I actually started cosplaying more around that time, um, not only because my daughter is an amazing costume designer, a professional, but because I love, as I've told people, when I'm in cosplay, it's the external representation of how I feel about myself. And I, I think it's kind of fun. Um, so who am I really? It's basically just someone who decided to truly care and get off my ass and do something. That's the only difference between me and anyone else. And so, because and, I'm like, again, I'm a geographer. I technically don't even belong in this industry. And yet I found a way to be here for 26 years and not only do my culturalization work, but actually care enough to try and change this industry for the better because I love all of you. I love what you do and I love what we create together. So a lot of that is being driven by this sentiment that evil triumphs when good people do nothing. And I really kind of embraced that when I went through my whole Matrix experience that I am not going to be that person ever again who sits back and just lets something happen. You know, I'm not gonna, and I, I don't care what it is. If I see someone being robbed on the street, I'm gonna go try and stop them. And some people say, well, that sounds really kind of superhero-ish, like crazy superhero. I'm like, I don't care, it works for me. Um, I would really like us to see, uh, see if we can avoid students coming into this industry having the sentiment that, they, that they're afraid of what future awaits them. With all of the amazing things that the game industry is and can be, I'm hoping you're, you're embracing it as a challenge that you can change because you are the future talent of the industry. And I'm actually working with a group of students. Um, we're going to release it somewhat, somewhat soon, where they, I'm helping them write a manifesto, which is basically a demand to the game industry that this is what we, as the future talent of this industry, we, this is what we expect of the industry of what we're going into. And so I'll eventually get that out there. But um, I think it's a great idea, because I think it's a good wake-up call to the industry to say we're we are your future we will be sitting in your chairs someday and this is what we're going to do to this industry and i think you should have that kind of proactive you know get shit done approach to it because you are creative advocates not just creators so you're not trying to change the entire world because when you look across the scope of everything that can possibly be changed that's a lot of times where we just get daunted we're just like i don't even know where to start that's totally fine just change your small corner of it. Find the one thing, one tiny little thing that's pissing you off, you know, that keeps pissing you off. Maybe it's something that's happening in the team that you're working with here, or it's something else that you're hearing from friends who are outside the industry that they keep repeating stupid media memes or something. Just find a way to change that one little thing, put the effort on that one little thing, because we're, if we're all doing that, Together, we do change things collectively, and that's really where the power is, you know, but we all have to have that commitment to actually try and do something. So, there you go. That's it. I'm done.
Yes, question, right. sorry. So my personal goal is to become the head of a studio, to start my own studio, to make games that are kind of about this, like about embracing who you are and creating change in the world, yada yada. But what can I do as somebody who's looking to start my own studio one day to be a better manager and to be a better studio owner? Number one thing you would have is really learn to put empathy in practice. That's one of the biggest problems I've seen in this industry is people don't show enough actual human empathy. When somebody comes to them and they say, I can't work today because I've got this issue going on with my partner or my child or whatever it might be, my pet. Um, you know, I understand the importance of actually adhering to deadlines and things like that, but if we lose our humanity in the process of management, then what's the point? The number one thing I, I often advise for people in a management role is you have to remember that management is service. It's not being an overlord to people, it's actually serving their needs. You are a shepherd, you are a servant of the people who are technically underneath you. And so if you treat them as people that you are basically acting as their primary shepherd, you know, and I think that analogy kind of works, um, basically, that's the shepherd's role. You're carrying after the, the sheep or whatever, but they're not sheep, obviously. But, um, but basically, put, your role, put yourself in the role of serving their needs, not demanding out of them what you need as a manager to hit your deadlines and things like that. So I think when we take that kind of, uh, take that kind of perspective as a manager, it changes everything. I, it, to me, it, it, it basically draws out our natural empathy. And if you can't be empathetic like that, then you have no business being in a management role, in my view. Thank you. Yes. Um, how would unionization affect small indie startups? So how would unionization affect small indie startups? That's a great question. And I think, honestly, in my perspective, I think unions are not going to do a lot for an indie. Because if you have, for example, an indie startup of maybe, I don't know, five people, six people, something like that, if they unionized, they're basically all co-owners anyway, probably. Um, and if they aren't, then you basically have four people unionizing against one manager. <laughs> and so it's kind of, it's just it's kind of weird. That's why I think, to me, like a more of a guild-like structure. And I, I know an example I heard of where um, there was one location where there were several indies working in like a shared workspace. They all had like a little office. And um, so basically, they ba what they did is they collectively hired one lawyer to represent them. So there was like five indie teams, all doing their own projects, all their own little small companies. But they hired one lawyer to basically lay some ground rules. So they kind of created their own collective. So what they did is they kind of did this, um, this uh, group power kind of thing. So they wrote up these rules of engagement. So for example, a lot of them do contract work in addition to the indie work they're doing, which is very common. And so if an external company would come to the group, basically they had to go to the lawyer and talk to the lawyer and, and basically negotiate with them about the work that was going to be pushed, even if, it, even if that contact came from like one of the companies. So basically it was their way to trying to like share the load, but also ensure that every one of them is being treated fairly and also getting paid the same rate. Because they said at one point they had some external company come in to do contract work and they talked to one of those little clusters, one of the companies, and they didn't like the price and they went to the one next door and they wanted a lower price, but they're all on the same price structure. So basically they decided to kind of pull their weight together. And it may not be a perfect system, but it basically helps protect them against that kind of practice. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can do that. Um, so I, but I don't think unions necessarily, I think what, what the unions do, however, what they can do for indies is that if they elevate the, the um, elevate the conditions for like AAA and, and larger studios, I think that hopefully will trickle down to indies and especially I hope it's going to reflect in how publishers and large studios interact with indies. They should know that they need to be uh, treating them fairly. And uh, because that could easily happen that this small indie could be a, have a successful game and suddenly grow bigger and then they'll unionize and they'll you know, sue the ass off the publisher or something. So basically, I, I think it's another way that it can help reinforce kind of a sense of fairness within the industry, even for indies. That's my, that's my view. Yes, back there. Yeah, so I used to be one of those. So, um, so I was I, when I started out at Microsoft in 1992. I was a perma temp. So I was one of those perma temps where they would have on for like 10 months, 
and then I had, had to take a mandatory two month break and then they would bring me back and bring me back and in the three and a half years I was a permit temp before I got my full time position I actually saw some of my colleagues retire because that was a time in the early 90s when the Microsoft stock was doubling like every few months and it was just ridiculous so I mean I honestly I saw people who had been hired just before me and then they retired by the time I got my headcount position because the stock had just gone through the roof and um, yeah I was definitely part of that class action lawsuit against Microsoft for the permatems way back then um, I basically in those kind of situations that's where I would uh, go actually report them uh, I would like we have here the tech what I, what's the name of them they're over in Redmond they um, basically it's like the tech workers coalition or something like that sorry I forget the name um, but they're basically like a form of a union or a collective and they're here in the area that basically protect contract workers at large tech companies so I would tell them and I would say, you know, this practice is, you know, this keeps going on and on and on. And uh, basically, the fact that they keep bringing you on, especially if when you're doing the work, you're doing the exact same level of work as any full-time employee. I mean, that's just wrong, in my view, because they're shafting you on all of the benefits and everything else that goes with it. So, I mean, my advice would be to go to that, that coalition group and report them and ask them, what can I do about this? Yes. I'm sorry, maybe I, I didn't hear quite well. So what was your... Well, your skills are considered your leverage. Your skills are your leverage? Yeah, and data possibilities? Yes, absolutely. No, that's a good point, too. Um, I mean, I guess in a way I was kind of in that position doing my culturalization work because nobody else does it. And so I don't know anyone else who does the same kind of work. And so I had the ability, it's like, well, you don't like what I do or you don't want to pay my price, that's fine, I'll walk. Good luck finding somebody else. Um, but that's a really good point. I mean, if you have a unique set of skills or you've shown a certain level of specialty um, that is going to be hard for them to replace, that is absolutely a form of leverage. I mean, obviously that works more in your favor individually, but if that's the case, then I would use that as well. I mean, I wouldn't overplay it, of course, um, because some companies, they'll, they'll, depending on the environment in which you're working in, sometimes they'll actually call your bluff and say, fine, go ahead, you know, go ahead and leave and we'll, we'll kind of do our best without you, which obviously is going to hurt them, but, um, you know, it depends who you're dealing with. But I think most companies, you know, would, would understand that if they see the value that you have in your special skill set, that they'll be at least willing to talk to you about it, whatever the issue might be. So, we have, we have time for just one more question. One more. Yeah. I, uh, the first hand I saw was way in the back, right there. Uh, so, the question is, what's your opinion on internships that are free? Like, free board. So, in, what's the opinion on internships that are free? Um, BS. That's <laughs> their bullshit. Um, <laughs> they're, I think, um, you always have to weigh. I don't think internships should ever be free. I think there should be some level of compensation. Um, I do like the fact, like for example, if you, unless they've changed it, but I know at Microsoft, when I was still there, the interns came in and got treated better than most of us full-time employees. So we actually had a little bit of jealousy going on because they got to do all this cool stuff and they were heaped upon all this, these gifts and access to things that we didn't necessarily have. And, um, you know, and they were paid. You know, they were paid in those positions. And of course, we understood that, you know, that is Microsoft's way of, of basically convincing that talent to stay. And um, I also know that within their internship program, um, the, at least again, the way it used to be run is that basically, if you got an internship, that basically already meant that they want you. But now they just want you to kind of work with them for a little while to kind of see how well of the, you know, if you're a quote Microsoft fit, as they always would say. Um, so I think that kind of program is great. I, I honestly think that internships should have some kind of compensation. I mean, but then again, you have to decide what you're willing to go for. I mean, um, like if you have, if there's a studio that um, you really want to work at or an IP you want to work on or whatever it might be, you know, it's like, do I want to get that experience? Because it's still experience, you're, you are getting something out of it, but honestly, if you're doing like hands-on work on a product that is going to be sold on the marketplace, 
um, it's like you should be compensated for it. So I would push for it, and I would a just say, look, I mean, uh, this is I'm going to be contributing my skill, and I am getting experience. Thank you, I appreciate it. But it's like I all like every student. It's like I've got bills to pay too. So I, I think that's something that we should push more for. I, I do that every day. Every day, for you guys. Like, yes. Thank you, Cameron. Yeah, any, uh, we should all applaud Kate.